A barbarian is a human who is perceived to be either uncivilized or primitive. The designation is usually applied as generalization based on a popular stereotype. Barbarians can be any member of a nation judged by some to be less civilized or orderly, such as a tribal society, but may also be part of a certain primitive cultural group such as nomads or social class such as bandits both within and outside one's own nation. Alternatively, they may instead be admired and romanticized as noble savages. In idiomatic or figurative usage, a barbarian may also be an individual reference to a brutal, cruel, warlike, and insensitive person. The term originates from the Greek, barbaros barbaros place barbaroi barbaroi. In ancient Greece, the Greeks used the term towards those who did not speak Greek and follow classical Greek customs. In ancient Rome, the Romans used the term towards tribal non-Romans such as the Germanics, Celts, Gauls, Iberians, Thracians, Illyrians, Berbers, Parthians, and Sarmatians. In the early modern period and sometimes later, the Byzantine Greeks used it for the Turks, in a clearly pejorative manner. Topic. Etymology. The ancient Greek name Barbaros, Barbaros, barbarian, was an antonym for polites, polites, citizen, from polis, polis, city-state. The earliest attested form of the word is the Mycenaean Greek, pa pa ro, written in Linear B syllabic script. The Greeks used the term barbarian for all non-Greek speaking peoples, including the Egyptians, Persians, Medes and Phoenicians, emphasizing their otherness. According to Greek writers, this was because the language they spoke sounded to Greeks like gibberish represented by the sounds bar, dot bar, the alleged root of the word barbaros, which is an echomimetic or onomatopoeic word. However, in various occasions, the term was also used by Greeks, especially the Athenians, to deride other Greek tribes and states such as Epirotes, Elans, Macedonians, Boeotians and Aeolic speakers but also fellow Athenians, in a pejorative and politically motivated manner. The term also carried a cultural dimension to its dual meaning. The verb barbarizo, barbarizo in ancient Greek meant to behave or talk like a barbarian, or to hold with the barbarians. Plato Statesman 262 de, rejected the Greek barbarian dichotomy as a logical absurdity on just such grounds, dividing the world into Greeks and non-Greeks told one nothing about the second group, yet Plato used the term barbarian frequently in his seventh letter. In Homer's works, the term appeared only once Iliad 2.867, in the form barbarophonos, barbarophonos, of incomprehensible speech, used of the Carians fighting for Troy during the Trojan War. In general, the concept of barbaros did not figure largely in archaic literature before the 5th century BC. It has been suggested that the barbarophonoi in the Iliad signifies not those who spoke a non-Greek language but simply those who spoke Greek badly. A change occurred in the connotations of the word after the Greco-Persian Wars in the first half of the 5th century BC. Here a hasty coalition of Greeks defeated the vast Persian Empire. Indeed, in the Greek of this period, barbarian is often used expressly to refer to Persians, who were enemies of the Greeks in this war. The Romans used the term barbarous for uncivilized people, opposite to Greek or Roman, and in fact, it became a common term to refer to all foreigners among Romans after Augustus' age as, among the Greeks, after the Persian Wars, the Persians, including the Germanic peoples, Persians, Gauls, Phoenicians and Carthaginians, the Greek term barbaros was the etymological source for many words meaning barbarian including English barbarian, which was first recorded in 16th century Middle English. A word barbara is also found in the Sanskrit of ancient India, with the primary meaning of stammering, implying someone with an unfamiliar language. The Greek word barbaros is related to Sanskrit barbaras, stammering. This Indo-European root is also found in Latin balbus for stammering, and Czech bulblati, to stammer. 
In Aramaic, Old Persian and Arabic context, the root refers to Babel confusedly. It appears as Barbary or in Old French Barbary, itself derived from the Arabic Barber, Berber, which is an ancient Arabic term for the North African inhabitants west of Egypt. The Arabic word might be ultimately from Greek Barbaria. Topic semantics The Oxford English Dictionary defines five meanings of the noun barbarian, including an obsolete Barbary usage. 1. Etymologically, a foreigner, one whose language and customs differ from the speakers, too. Hist, a. 1 not a Greek, b. 1 living outside the pale of the Roman Empire and its civilization, applied especially to the northern nations that overthrew them, c. 1 outside the pale of Christian civilization, d. With the Italians of the Renaissance, one of a nation outside of Italy, 3. A rude, wild, uncivilized person, b. Sometimes distinguished from savage, per, with a glance at two, c, applied by the Chinese contemptuously to foreigners. 4. An uncultured person, or one who has no sympathy with literary culture. 5. A native of Barbary. C. Barbary Coast, OBs. B. Barbary Pirates and a Barbary Horse. OBs, the OED Barbarous Entry summarizes the semantic history. The sense development in ancient times was, with the Greeks, foreign, non-Hellenic, later outlandish, rude, brutal, with the Romans, not Latin nor Greek, then pertaining to those outside the Roman Empire, hence uncivilized, uncultured, and later non-Christian, whence Saracen, heathen, and generally savage, rude, savagely cruel, inhuman. Topic. In classical Greco-Roman contexts Topic. Historical developments Greek attitudes towards «barbarians» developed in parallel with the growth of chattel slavery, especially in Athens. Although the enslavement of Greeks for non-payment of debts continued in most Greek states, Athens banned this practice under Solon in the early 6th century BC. Under the Athenian democracy established ca. 508 BC, slavery came into use on a scale never before seen among the Greeks. Massive concentrations of slaves worked under especially brutal conditions in the silver mines at Laurion in southeastern Attica after the discovery of a major vein of silver-bearing ore there in 483 BC, while the phenomenon of skilled slave craftsmen producing manufactured goods in small factories and workshops became increasingly common. Furthermore, slave ownership no longer became the preserve of the rich, all but the poorest of Athenian households came to have slaves in order to supplement the work of their free members. The slaves of Athens that had barbarian origins were coming especially from lands around the Black Sea such as Thrace and Taurisa Crimea, while Lydians, Phrygians and Carians came from Asia Minor. Aristotle Politics 1.2-7, characterizes barbarians as slaves by nature. From this period, words like barbarophonos, cited above from Homer, came into use not only for the sound of a foreign language but also for foreigners who spoke Greek improperly. In the Greek language, the word logos expressed both the notions of language and reason. So Greek speakers readily conflated speaking poorly with stupidity. Further changes occurred in the connotations of Barbary, Barbaroi in late antiquity, when bishops and Catholicoi were appointed to sees connected to cities among the civilized gentis barbaricae such as in Armenia or Persia, whereas bishops were appointed to supervise entire peoples among the less settled. Eventually the term found a hidden meaning through the folk etymology of Cassiodorus c. 485 c. 585. He stated that the word barbarian was made up of barba beard and rus flat land, for barbarians did not live in cities, making their abodes in the fields like wild animals. Topic. 
Hellenic stereotypes From classical origins the Hellenic stereotype of barbarism evolved, barbarians are like children, unable to speak or reason properly, cowardly, effeminate, luxurious, cruel, unable to control their appetites and desires, politically unable to govern themselves. Writers voiced these stereotypes with much shrillness. Isocrates in the 4th century BC, for example, called for a war of conquest against Persia as a panacea for Greek problems. However, the disparaging Hellenic stereotype of barbarians did not totally dominate Hellenic attitudes. Xenophon died 354 BC, for example, wrote the Cyropedia, a laudatory fictionalized account of Cyrus the Great, the founder of the Persian Empire, effectively a utopian text. In his Anabasis, Xenophon's accounts of the Persians and other non-Greeks who he knew or encountered show few traces of the stereotypes. In Plato's Protagoras, Prodicus of Ceos calls barbarian the Aeolian dialect that Pittacus of Mytilene spoke, the renowned orator Demosthenes 384-322 BC made derogatory comments in his speeches, using the word barbarian. In the Bible's New Testament, St. Paul from Tarsus lived about AD 5 to about AD 67 uses the word barbarian in its Hellenic sense to refer to non-Greeks Romans chapter 1 verse 14, and he also uses it to characterize one who merely speaks a different language 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 11. About a hundred years after Paul's time, Lucian, a native of Samosata, in the former kingdom of Commagene, which had been absorbed by the Roman Empire and made part of the province of Syria, used the term barbarian to describe himself. Because he was a noted satirist, this could have indicated self-deprecating irony. It might also have suggested descent from Samosata's original Semitic population, who were likely called barbarians by later Hellenistic, Greek-speaking settlers, and might have eventually taken up this appellation themselves. The term retained its standard usage in the Greek language throughout the Middle Ages. Byzantine Greeks used it widely until the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, later named the Byzantine Empire, in the 15th century, 1453, with the fall of capital city Constantinople. Cicero 106 to 43 BC described the mountain area of Inner Sardinia as a land of barbarians with these inhabitants also known by the manifestly pejorative term latrones mastrucati thieves with a rough garment in wool the region still known as barbagia in sardinian barbagia or barbaza preserves this old barbarian designation in its name, but it no longer consciously retains barbarian associations. The inhabitants of the area themselves use the name naturally and unaffectedly. Topic. The dying Galatian statue The statue of the dying Galatian provides some insight into the Hellenistic perception of an attitude towards barbarians. Attalus I of Pergamon ruled 241-197 BC commissioned 220s BC a statue to celebrate his victory CA 232 BC over the Celtic Galatians in Anatolia the bronze original is lost, but a Roman marble copy was found in the 17th century. The statue depicts with remarkable realism a dying Celt warrior with a typically Celtic hairstyle and mustache. He sits on his fallen shield while a sword and other objects lie beside him. He appears to be fighting against death, refusing to accept his fate. The statue serves both as a reminder of the Celts' defeat, thus demonstrating the might of the people who defeated them, and a memorial to their bravery as worthy adversaries. As H. W. Jansen comments, the sculpture conveys the message that they knew how to die, barbarians that they were. Topic. Utter barbarism, civilization, and the noble savage 
The Greeks admired Scythians and Galatians as heroic individuals, and even as in the case of Anacarsis as philosophers, but they regarded their culture as barbaric. The Romans indiscriminately characterized the various Germanic tribes, the settled Gauls, and the raiding Huns as barbarians, and subsequent classically oriented historical narratives depicted the migrations associated with the end of the Western Roman Empire as the barbarian invasions. The Romans adapted the term in order to refer to anything that was non-Roman. The German cultural historian Silvio Vieta points out that the meaning of the word barbarous has undergone a semantic change in modern times, after Michel de Montaigne used it to characterize the activities of the Spaniards in the New World, supposedly representatives of the higher European culture, as barbarous in a satirical essay published in the year 1580. It was not the supposedly uncivilized Indian tribes who were barbarous, but the conquering Spaniards. Montaigne argued that Europeans noted the barbarism of other cultures but not the crueler and more brutal actions of their own societies, particularly in his time during the so-called religious wars. In Montaigne's view, his own people, the Europeans, were the real barbarians. In this way, the Eurocentric argument was turned around and applied to the European invaders. With this shift in meaning, a whole literature arose in Europe that characterized the indigenous Indian peoples as innocent, and the militarily superior Europeans as barbarous intruders invading a paradisical world. Topic. In international historical contexts Historically, the term barbarian has seen widespread use, in English. Many peoples have dismissed alien cultures and even rival civilizations, because they were unrecognizably strange. For instance, the nomadic steppe peoples north of the Black Sea, including the Pechenegs and the Kipchaks, were called barbarians by the Byzantines. Topic. Middle East and North Africa The native Berbers of North Africa were among the many peoples called barbarian by the early Romans. The term continued to be used by medieval Arabs see Berber etymology before being replaced by Amazai. In English, the term Berber continues to be used as an exonym. The geographical term Barbary or Barbary Coast, and the name of the Barbary pirates based on that coast and who were not necessarily Berbers were also derived from it. The term has also been used to refer to people from Barbary, a region encompassing most of North Africa. The name of the region, Barbary, comes from the Arabic word Barber, possibly from the Latin word Barbaricum, meaning, Land of the Barbarians. Many languages define the other as those who do not speak one's language. Greek barbaroi was paralleled by Arabic ajam, non-Arabic speakers, non-Arabs, especially Persians. Topic: <laughs> South Asia. In the ancient Indian epic Mahabharata, the Sanskrit word barbara meant stammering, wretch, foreigner, sinful people, low and barbarous. According to Romila Thapar, the Indo-Aryan semi-nomadic people viewed the indigenous people as barbarians when they arrived. Indo-Aryan used the term MLECCHA in referring to people outside the caste system and ritual ambience. Topic. East Asia. Topic. China The term, barbarian, in traditional Chinese culture had several aspects. For one thing, Chinese has more than one historical, barbarian, exonym. Several historical Chinese characters for non-Chinese peoples were graphic pejoratives. The character for the Yao people, for instance, was changed from Yao Yao, jackal, to Yao Yao. 
precious jade in the modern period. The original Yi distinction between Chinese and barbarian was based on culture and power but not on race. Historically, the Chinese used various words for foreign ethnic groups. They include terms like yi yi, which is often translated as barbarians. Despite this conventional translation, there are also other ways of translating yi into English. Some of the examples include foreigners, ordinary others, wild tribes, uncivilized tribes, and so forth. Topic. History and terminology Chinese historical records mention what may now perhaps be termed barbarian peoples for over four millennia, although this considerably predates the Greek language origin of the term barbarian, at least as is known from the 34 centuries of written records in the Greek language. The sinologist Hurley Glessner Creel said, Throughout Chinese history, the barbarians have been a constant motif, sometimes minor, sometimes very major indeed. They figure prominently in the Shang Oracle inscriptions, and the dynasty that came to an end only in 1912 was, from the Chinese point of view, barbarian. Shang Dynasty 1600 to 1046 BC oracles and bronze inscriptions first recorded specific Chinese exonyms for foreigners, often in contexts of warfare or tribute. King Wu Ding R. 1250-1192 BC, for instance, fought with the Gafang Gui Fang, DD, and Chang Chang, barbarians. During the spring and autumn period 771 to 476 BC, the meanings of four exonyms were expanded. These included Rong, Yi, Man, and Di, all general designations referring to the barbarian tribes. These Siyic Yi, four barbarians, most probably the names of ethnic groups originally, were the Yi or Dong Yi Dong Yi. Eastern Barbarians, Man or Nanman Nanman, Southern Barbarians, Rong or Shirong Shi Rong, Western Barbarians, and Di or Bidi Bay Di, Northern Barbarians, the Russian anthropologist Mikhail Krukov concluded. Evidently, the barbarian tribes at first had individual names, but during about the middle of the first millennium BC, they were classified schematically according to the four cardinal points of the compass. This would, in the final analysis, mean that once again territory had become the primary criterion of the we group, whereas the consciousness of common origin remained secondary. What continued to be important were the factors of language, the acceptance of certain forms of material culture, the adherence to certain rituals, and, above all, the economy and the way of life. Agriculture was the only appropriate way of life for the Hua The Chinese classics use compounds of these four generic names in localized barbarian tribes, exonyms such as West and North, Rongdi. South and East. Manyi, Nanyibidi. Barbarian tribes in the South and the North. And Menirangdi. All kinds of barbarians. Creel says the Chinese evidently came to use Rongdi and Manyi as generalized terms denoting non Chinese, foreigners, barbarians. And a statement such as, The Rong and Di are wolves. Zhujiang, Min 1 is very much like the assertion that many people in many lands will make today, that no foreigner can be trusted. The Chinese had at least two reasons for vilifying and depreciating the non-Chinese groups. On the one hand, many of them harassed and pillaged the Chinese, which gave them a genuine grievance. On the other, it is quite clear that the Chinese were increasingly encroaching upon the territory of these peoples, getting the better of them by trickery, and putting many of them under subjection. By vilifying them and depicting them as somewhat less than human, the Chinese could justify their conduct and still any qualms of conscience. 
This word Yi has both specific references, such as to Yi 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 peoples in the Yi River region, and generalized references to barbarian, foreigner, non-Chinese. Lin Yutang's Chinese English Dictionary of Modern Usage translates Yi as ANC barbarian tribe on east border, any border or foreign tribe. The sinologist Edwin G. Pulleyblank says the name Yi furnished the primary Chinese term for barbarian. But paradoxically the Yi were considered the most civilized of the non-Chinese peoples. Topic. Idealization Some Chinese classics romanticize or idealize barbarians, comparable to the Western noble savage construct. For instance, the Confucian Analects records, The master said, the Yid barbarians of the East and North have retained their princes. They are not in such a state of decay as we in China. The master said, the way makes no progress. I shall get upon a raft and float out to sea. The master wanted to settle among the Juyi Nine wild tribes of the East. Someone said, I am afraid you would find it hard to put up with their lack of refinement. The master said, were a true gentleman to settle among them there would soon be no trouble about lack of refinement. The translator Arthur Whaley noted that a certain idealization of the noble savage is to be found fairly often in early Chinese literature. Citing the Zuo Zhuan maxim, when the emperor no longer functions, learning must be sought among the four barbarians, north, west, east, and south. Professor Creel said, From ancient to modern times the Chinese attitude toward people not Chinese in culture. Barbarians has commonly been one of contempt, sometimes tinged with fear. It must be noted that, while the Chinese have disparaged barbarians, they have been singularly hospitable both to individuals and to groups that have adopted Chinese culture. And at times they seem to have had a certain admiration, perhaps unwilling, for the rude force of these peoples or simpler customs. In a somewhat related example, Mencius believed that Confucian practices were universal and timeless, and thus followed by both Hua and Yi. Shun was an eastern barbarian, he was born in Chu Feng, moved to Fu Sha, and died in Ming Tiao. King Wen was a western barbarian, he was born in Chai Chou and died in Pai Ying. Their native places were over a thousand li apart, and there were a thousand years between them. Yet when they had their way in the central kingdoms, their actions matched like the two halves of a tally. The standards of the two sages, one earlier and one later, were identical. The prominent 121 CE Shuao and Jiezi character dictionary defines Yi Yi as men of the East. Dong Fang Ji Ren. The dictionary also informs that Yi is not dissimilar from the Sha Sha, which means Chinese. Elsewhere in the Shuowen Jiezi, under the entry of Chang Chang, the term Yi is associated with benevolence and human longevity. Yi countries are therefore virtuous places where people live long lives. This is why Confucius wanted to go to Yi countries when the Tao could not be realized in the central states. Topic. Pejorative Chinese characters Some Chinese characters used to transcribe non-Chinese peoples were graphically pejorative ethnic slurs, in which the insult derived not from the Chinese word but from the character used to write it. For instance, the written Chinese transcription of Yao, the Yao people, who primarily live in the mountains of southwest China and Vietnam. When 11th century Song dynasty authors first transcribed the exonym Yao, they insultingly chose Yao Yao, jackal, from a lexical selection of over 100 characters pronounced Yao, e.g., waste, Yao, distant, Yao, shake. During a series of 20th century Chinese language reforms, this graphic pejorative Yao, written with the Quan, dog, beast radical, jackal, the Yao, was replaced twice, first with the invented character Yao Yao, 
human radical the yao then with yao yao jade radical precious jade the yao chinese orthography symbols used to write a language can provide unique opportunities to write ethnic insults logographically that do not exist alphabetically for the yao ethnic group there is a difference between the transcriptions yao yao jackal and yao yao jade but none between the romanizations yao and yao topic cultural and racial barbarianism According to the archaeologist William Meacham, it was only by the time of the late Shang dynasty that one can speak of Chinese, Chinese culture, or Chinese civilization. There is a sense in which the traditional view of ancient Chinese history is correct and perhaps it originated ultimately in the first appearance of dynastic civilization, those on the fringes and outside this esoteric event were barbarians, in that they did not enjoy or suffer from the fruit of civilization until they were brought into close contact with it by an imperial expansion of the civilization itself. In a similar vein, Creel explained the significance of Confucian Li, ritual, rites, propriety. The fundamental criterion of Chinese-ness, anciently and throughout history, has been cultural. The Chinese have had a particular way of life, a particular complex of usages, sometimes characterized as Li. Groups that conformed to this way of life were, generally speaking, considered Chinese. Those that turned away from it were considered to cease to be Chinese. It was the process of acculturation, transforming barbarians into Chinese, that created the great bulk of the Chinese people. The barbarians of Western Cho times were, for the most part, future Chinese, or the ancestors of future Chinese. This is a fact of great importance. It is significant, however, that we almost never find any references in the early literature to physical differences between Chinese and barbarians. Insofar as we can tell, the distinction was purely cultural. Decatur says, Thought in ancient China was oriented towards the world, or Tianjia, all under heaven. The world was perceived as one homogeneous unity named Great Community. De Tong, the Middle Kingdom, China, dominated by the assumption of its cultural superiority, measured outgroups according to a yardstick by which those who did not follow the Chinese ways were considered barbarians, a theory of using the Chinese ways to transform the barbarian, as strongly advocated. It was believed that the barbarian could be culturally assimilated. In the Age of Great Peace, the barbarians would flow in and be transformed, the world would be one. According to the Pakistani academic M. Shahid Alam, the centrality of culture, rather than race, in the Chinese world view had an important corollary. Nearly always, this translated into a civilizing mission rooted in the premise that the barbarians could be culturally assimilated. Namely Lai Hua Lai Hua, come and be transformed, or Han Hua Han Hua, become Chinese, be sinicized. Two millennia before the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss wrote The Raw and the Cooked, the Chinese differentiated raw and cooked categories of barbarian peoples who lived in China. The Shu Fan Shu Fan, cooked food eating barbarians are sometimes interpreted as sinicized, and the shengfan shengfan raw food-eating barbarians as not sinicized. The Li Ji gives this description. The people of those five regions, the middle states, and the Rong, Yi and other wild tribes around them had all their several natures, which they could not be made to alter. The tribes on the east were called Yi. They had their hair unbound, and tattooed their bodies. Some of them ate their food without its being cooked with fire. Those on the south were called man. They tattooed their foreheads, and had their feet turned toward each other. Some of them ate their food without its being cooked with fire. 
Those on the west were called wrong. They had their hair unbound, and wore skins. Some of them did not eat grain food. Those on the north were called d. They wore skins of animals and birds, and dwelt in caves. Some of them did not eat grain food. Decatur explains the close association between nature and nurture. The Shangfan, literally raw barbarians, were considered savage and resisting. The Shufan, or cooked barbarians, were tame and submissive. The consumption of raw food was regarded as an infallible sign of savagery that affected the physiological state of the barbarian. Some Warring States period texts record a belief that the respective natures of the Chinese and the barbarian were incompatible. Mencius, for instance, once stated, I have heard of the Chinese converting barbarians to their ways, but not of their being converted to barbarian ways. Decatur says, The nature of the Chinese was regarded as impermeable to the evil influences of the barbarian, no retrogression was possible. Only the barbarian might eventually change by adopting Chinese ways. However, different thinkers and texts convey different opinions on this issue. The prominent Tang Confucian Han Yu, for example, wrote in his essay Yuan Dao the following. When Confucius wrote the Chun Chu, he said that if the feudal lords use Yi ritual, then they should be called Yi, if they use Chinese rituals, then they should be called Chinese. Han Yu went on to lament in the same essay that the Chinese of his time might all become Yi because the Tang court wanted to put Yi laws above the teachings of the former kings. Therefore, Han Yu's essay shows the possibility that the Chinese can lose their culture and become the uncivilized outsiders, and that the uncivilized outsiders have the potential to become Chinese. After the Song dynasty, many of China's rulers in the north were of Inner Asia ethnicities, such as the Khitans, Jechens, and Mongols of the Liao, Jin and Yuan dynasties, the latter ended up ruling over the entire China. Hence, the historian John King Fairbank wrote, The influence on China of the great fact of alien conquest under the Liao Jin Yuan dynasties is just beginning to be explored. During the Qing dynasty, the rulers of China adopted Confucian philosophy and Han Chinese institutions to show that the Manchu rulers had received the mandate of heaven to rule China. At the same time, they also tried to retain their own indigenous culture. Due to the Manchu's adoption of Han Chinese culture, most Han Chinese though not all, did accept the Manchus as the legitimate rulers of China. Similarly, according to Fudan University historian Yao Dali, even the supposedly patriotic hero Wen Tianxiang of the late Song and early Yuan period did not believe the Mongol rule to be illegitimate. In fact, Wen was willing to live under Mongol rule as long as he was not forced to be a Yuan dynasty official, out of his loyalty to the Song dynasty. Yao explains that Wen chose to die in the end because he was forced to become a Yuan official. So, Wen chose death due to his loyalty to his dynasty, not because he viewed the Yuan court as a non-Chinese, illegitimate regime and therefore refused to live under their rule. Yao also says that many Chinese who were living in the Yuan Ming transition period also shared Wen's beliefs of identifying with and putting loyalty towards one's dynasty above racial, ethnic differences. Many Han Chinese writers did not celebrate the collapse of the Mongols and the return of the Han Chinese rule in the form of the Ming dynasty government at that time. Many Han Chinese actually chose not to serve in the new Ming court at all due to their loyalty to the Yuan. Some Han Chinese also committed suicide on behalf of the Mongols as a proof of their loyalty. We should note that the founder of the Ming dynasty, Zhu Yanzhong, also indicated that he was happy to be born in the Yuan period and that the Yuan did legitimately receive the mandate of heaven to rule over China. On a side note, one of his key advisors, Lu Ji, generally supported the idea that while the Chinese and the non-Chinese are different, they are actually equal. Lu was therefore arguing against the idea that the Chinese were and are superior to the Yi 
These things show that many times, pre-modern Chinese did view culture and sometimes politics rather than race and ethnicity as the dividing line between the Chinese and the non-Chinese. In many cases, the non-Chinese could and did become the Chinese and vice versa, especially when there was a change in culture. Topic. Modern reinterpretations According to the historian Frank de Cotter, the delusive myth of a Chinese antiquity that abandoned racial standards in favor of a concept of cultural universalism in which all barbarians could ultimately participate has understandably attracted some modern scholars. Living in an unequal and often hostile world, it is tempting to project the utopian image of a racially harmonious world into a distant and obscure past. The politician, historian, and diplomat K.C. Wu analyzes the origin of the characters for the Yi, Man, Rong, Di, and Sha peoples and concludes that the ancients formed these characters with only one purpose in mind to describe the different ways of living each of these people pursued. Despite the well-known examples of pejorative exonymic characters such as the dog radical, in D, he claims there is no hidden racial bias in the meanings of the characters used to describe these different peoples, but rather the differences were in occupation or in custom, not in race or origin. K.C. Wu says the modern character Yi designating the historical Yi peoples, composed of the characters for Da, big person, and Gong, bow, implies a big person carrying a bow, someone to perhaps be feared or respected, but not to be despised. However, differing from K.C. Wu, the scholar Wu Qichang believes that the earliest oracle bone script for Yi Yi was used interchangeably with Shi Shi corpse. The historian John Hill explains that Yi was used rather loosely for non-Chinese populations of the East. It carried the connotation of people ignorant of Chinese culture and, therefore, barbarians. Christopher I Beckwith makes the extraordinary claim that the name barbarian should only be used for Greek historical contexts, and is inapplicable for all other peoples to whom it has been applied either historically or in modern times. Beckwith notes that most specialists in East Asian history, including him, have translated Chinese exonyms as English. Barbarian. He believes that after academics read his published explanation of the problems, except for direct quotations of earlier scholars who use the word, it should no longer be used as a term by any writer. The first problem is that it is impossible to translate the word barbarian into Chinese because the concept does not exist in Chinese, meaning a single, completely generic loanword from Greek barber. Until the Chinese borrow the word barbarian or one of its relatives, or make up a new word that explicitly includes the same basic ideas, they cannot express the idea of the barbarian in Chinese. The usual standard Chinese translation of English barbarian is Yemenren traditional Chinese, Yemenren simplified Chinese, Yemenren pinyin, Yemenren, which Beckwith claims actually means wild man, savage. That is very definitely not the same thing as barbarian. Despite this semantic hypothesis, Chinese English dictionaries regularly translate Yemenren as barbarian or barbarians. Beckwith concedes that the early Chinese apparently disliked foreigners in general and looked down on them as having an inferior culture and pejoratively wrote some exonyms. However, he purports, the fact that the Chinese did not like foreigner Y and occasionally picked a transcriptional character with negative meaning in Chinese to write the sound of his ethnonym, is irrelevant. Beckwith's second problem is with linguists and lexicographers of Chinese. 
If one looks up in a Chinese-English dictionary the two dozen or so partly generic words used for various foreign peoples throughout Chinese history, one will find most of them defined in English as, in effect, a kind of barbarian. Even the works of well-known lexicographers such as Karlgren do this. Although Beckwith does not cite any examples, the Swedish sinologist Bernhard Karlgren edited two dictionaries, Analytic Dictionary of Chinese and Sino-Japanese and Grammata Serica Recensa Compare Karlgren's translations of the SIYI, Four Barbarians, Yi Yi, Barbarian, Foreigner, Destroy, Raise to the Ground. Barbarian, especially tribes to the east of ancient China. Man, man. Barbarians of the south, barbarian, savage. Southern barbarian. Wrong, wrong. Weapons, armor, war, warrior, NPR, of western tribes. Weapon, attack, war chariot, loan for tribes of the west. DD. Northern Barbarians. Fire Dogs. Quote, comma, quote. Name of a Northern Tribe, Low Servant. The Sino-Tibetan Etymological Dictionary and Thesaurus Project includes Karlgren's GSR definitions. Searching the STEDT database finds various a kind of definitions for plant and animal names, e.g., UU, a kind of monkey, but not one. A kind of barbarian. Definition. Besides faulting Chinese for lacking a general barbarian term, Beckwith also faults English, which has no words for the many foreign peoples referred to by one or another classical Chinese word, such as hu hu, yi yi, man man, and so on. The third problem involves Tang dynasty usages of fan, foreigner, and lu, prisoner. Neither of which meant barbarian. Beckwith says Tang texts used fan fan or fan foreigner. See Sheng Fan and Shu Fan above as perhaps the only true generic at any time in Chinese literature was practically the opposite of the word barbarian. It meant simply foreign, foreigner without any pejorative meaning. In modern usage, fan fan means foreigner, barbarian, aborigine. The linguist Robert Ramsey illustrates the pejorative connotations of fan. The word fan was formerly used by the Chinese almost innocently in the sense of aborigines to refer to ethnic groups in South China, and Mao Zedong himself once used it in 1938 in a speech advocating equal rights for the various minority peoples. But that term has now been so systematically purged from the language that it is not to be found at least in that meaning even in large dictionaries, and all references to Mao's 1938 speech have excised the offending word and replaced it with a more elaborate locution, Yao, Yi, and Yu. The Tang Dynasty Chinese also had a derogatory term for foreigners, Lu traditional Chinese, Lu simplified Chinese, Lu pinyin, Lu. Prisoner, slave, captive. Beckwith says it means something like, those miscreants who should be locked up. Therefore, the word does not even mean foreigner at all, let alone barbarian. Christopher I. Beckwith's 2009, The Barbarians, epilogue provides many references, but overlooks H. G. Creel's 1970, The Barbarians, chapter. Creel descriptively wrote, who, in fact, were the barbarians. The Chinese have no single term for them. But they were all the non-Chinese, just as for the Greeks the barbarians were all the non-Greeks. Beckwith prescriptively wrote, the Chinese, however, have still not yet borrowed Greek barber. There is also no single native Chinese word for foreigner, no matter how pejorative which meets his strict definition of barbarian. Topic. Barbarian puppet drinking game 
In the Tang Dynasty houses of pleasure, where drinking games were common, small puppets in the aspect of Westerners, in a ridiculous state of drunkenness, were used in one popular permutation of the drinking game, so, in the form of blue-eyed, pointy-nosed, and peak-capped barbarians, these puppets were manipulated in such a way as to occasionally fall down, then, whichever guest to whom the puppet pointed after falling was then obliged by honor to empty his cup of Chinese wine. Topic. Japan When Europeans came to Japan, they were called Nanban, Nanman literally barbarians from the south, because the Portuguese ships appeared to sail from the south. The Dutch, who arrived later, were also called either Nanban or Como, Hong Mao literally meaning red hair. Topic. Pre-Columbian Americas In Mesoamerica the Aztec civilization used the word Chichimeca to denominate a group of nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes that lived on the outskirts of the Triple Alliance's empire, in the north of modern Mexico, and whom the Aztec people saw as primitive and uncivilized. One of the meanings attributed to the word Chichimeca is dog people. The Incas of South America used the term Peruma Auca for all peoples living outside the rule of their empire see Promouses. The British, and later the white colonial settlers of the United States, referred to Native Americans as savages. <laughs> <laughs> Barbarian mercenaries The entry of barbarians into mercenary service in a metropole repeatedly occurs in history as a standard way in which peripheral peoples from and beyond frontier regions relate to civilized imperial powers as part of a semi foreign militarized proletariat examples include nomadic frontier tribes serving in pre-modern china Mainly Germanic soldiery in the armies of the declining Roman Empire. Viking Varangian guards in Imperial Byzantium. Turkic mercenaries in the Abbasid Caliphate. Widespread use of ethnic mercenary forces in prehistoric Mesoamerica. Cossack units in the armies of, for example, Poland-Lithuania and of pre-Soviet Russia. Gurkha units in the British and Indian armies. Topic. Early modern period Italians in the Renaissance often called anyone who lived outside of their country a barbarian. As an example, there is the last chapter of The Prince by Niccolò Machiavelli. Exhortatio ad capizandum Italium in libertatum qua a barbaris vincicandum. In English, exhortation to take Italy and free her from the barbarians in which he appeals to Lorenzo de Medici, Duke of Urbino to unite Italy and stop the barbarian invasions led by other European rulers, such as Charles VIII and Louis XII, both of France, and Ferdinand II of Aragon. Spanish sea captain Francisco de Cuellar, who sailed with the Spanish Armada in 1588, used the term savage salvaje to describe the Irish people. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Marxist use of barbarism. In her 1916 anti-war pamphlet The Crisis of German Social Democracy, Marxist theorist Rosa Luxemburg writes, Bourgeois society stands at the crossroads, either transition to socialism or regression into barbarism. Luxemburg attributed it to Friedrich Engels, though, as shown by Michael Lowy, Engels had not used the term barbarism. But a less resounding formulation, if the whole of modern society is not to perish, a revolution in the mode of production and distribution must take place. 
The case has been made that Luxembourg had remembered a passage from the Erfurt program, written in 1892 by Karl Kautsky, and mistakenly attributed it to Engels, as things stand today capitalist civilization cannot continue, we must either move forward into socialism or fall back into barbarism, Luxembourg went on to explain what she meant by regression into barbarism. A look around us at this moment i.e., 1916 Europe shows what the regression of bourgeois society into barbarism means. This world war is a regression into barbarism. The triumph of imperialism leads to the annihilation of civilization. At first, this happens sporadically for the duration of a modern war, but then when the period of unlimited wars begins it progresses toward its inevitable consequences. Today, we face the choice exactly as Friedrich Engels foresaw it a generation ago, either the triumph of imperialism and the collapse of all civilization as in ancient Rome, depopulation, desolation, degeneration, a great cemetery. Or the victory of socialism, that means the conscious active struggle of the international proletariat against imperialism and its method of war. Socialism or barbarism becomes, and remains, an often quoted and influential concept in Marxist literature. Barbarism is variously interpreted as meaning either a technologically advanced but extremely exploitative and oppressive society e.g. a victory and world domination by Nazi Germany and its fascist allies, a collapse of technological civilization due to capitalism causing a nuclear war or ecological disaster, or the one form of barbarism bringing on the other. The internationalist communist tendency considers socialism or barbarism, to be a variant of the earlier liberty or death used by revolutionaries of different stripes since the late 18th century. Topic. Modern popular culture Modern popular culture contains such fantasy barbarians as Conan the Barbarian. In such fantasy, the negative connotations traditionally associated with barbarian are often inverted. For example, The Phoenix on the Sword, 1932, the first of Robert E. Howard's Conan series, is set soon after the barbarian protagonist had forcibly seized the turbulent kingdom of Aquilonia from King Numedides, whom he strangled upon his throne. The story is clearly slanted to imply that the kingdom greatly benefited by power passing from a decadent and tyrannical hereditary monarch to a strong and vigorous barbarian usurper. <laughs> See also